exciting to have so much creative, pro creative programming here in Longmont. One year ago today, La Longmont Out Loud presented its first ever show, an open stage at the Times Collaborative. And today is their 11th show. Give it up for that. Yeah. They presented 40 local performers, and that number continues to change and get louder and bigger. And if you're in the audience and you are a creative, talk to Audrey after this show, um, because we want to continue to, to promote all of the ways in which we can share our imaginations. Thank you to Amy Ellis and Tumbleweed Art Collective for opening your doors. What a great space. Make some noise if this is your first time here. What have you been waiting for? It's my first time too. Um, this show is sponsored by Longmont Public Media, Longmont's media maker space. Please give it up for them. Go to longmontpublicmedia.org to learn more information if you want to learn about media, podcasts, video production. Um, my therapist asks me to compose a list of anger. It is hot, like Phoenix, Arizona. Third degree burns to my organs, my teeth. How can I speak about something that tears apart my flesh, that leaves me unprotected? All those times my welcome mat was set on fire, my body a chalk outline, a cocoon of caution tape. It is so much easier to be complicit, to hide my no beneath my tongue. They think I am a woman. I guess I need to keep playing that role. She tells me we are made up of wilderness and fences. My therapist gives me a hammer made from amniotic fluid. It drips of my ancestors. That is a lot of anger. My people were burned alive. My words have been singed in ways that I can still smell the rot, the entrails of charcoal. I don't know how to give you angry. I know sad so well we hold hands in the night. Sad spoons me until I fall asleep. Sad French kisses my nightmares away. But anger is like that popular kid who dominates the lunchroom in high school. I can't even sit in the same room. My words mumble. I'm just not cool enough, contained enough for that. My therapist calls emotions orphans. So often they are left alone, unhoused, neglected. I tell her that I have given birth to so many screams, that my limbs are a tangle of words clogged and gagged. All this bloat in my body comes from it. I am angry that I still need to repeat how uncomfortable you make me. I am angry that kids are growing up thinking they can't be alive and be themselves at the same time. I'm angry you are banning books that saved my life. I'm angry that I love to eat meat and suddenly it is more expensive than I can afford. I'm angry that water isn't free. I'm angry that that apple tree on your front yard is dripping meals and you are just letting them rot to the ground. I'm angry that he could be president again. I'm angry that you don't know how dangerous you are. I'm angry that education isn't free. I'm angry that I will never be able to afford to own my own home. I'm angry that my students feel disillusioned about their future. I'm angry that our bodies somehow belong to the government. I'm angry that my favorite childhood restaurant closed. I'm angry that you think your behavior is okay. I'm angry that you keep talking. I'm angry. I am, I, my therapist sets out an extra chair for my anger, tells me to look at it smell its rage, notice the texture it has grown into, insists I confront it, I choke, my throat expands, I need to make room for it, it's bigger than anything I've ever made room for, it has been feasting on my insides for decades, it has become its own planet, I unhinge, the volume is low, so I turn it up so loud, my anger vibrates against the walls. 
my therapist smiles. This is only the beginning. Lisa Trank began writing after many years as a performing artist and actress and singer, and she is thrilled to integrate those years of crafting characters and storytelling. A former recipient of a Rocky Mountain Women's Institute Fellowship, much of Lisa's fiction writing focuses on the stories she grew up with as the proud first-generation daughter of immigrants. She loves writing from a place of joy and to shine a light on Jewish families and life for all young readers. The pieces she will be performing for Longmont Out Loud tonight are centered on parenting and Jewish lifestyle. Lisa is an active member of the Rocky Mountain chapter of the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Please welcome Lisa Trank to our stage. Thank you. Hi, little plant. So what I'm gonna do tonight has got nothing to do with children's literature. It's a... Uh, let me get settled here. So a year ago, I met this extraordinary being, Audrey, who invited me to share my stories. And after a lot of years of not feeling safe on stage, I found out that I could be safe on stage again. I also found out that I was kind of funny. <laughs> but tonight's not going to be funny. As much as I love hearing people laugh at my words. A year ago, I made a, a very sincere promise to myself that I would only show up in the most authentic way possible. And laughter is not where my head is or my heart. Um, <laughs> I need to be accountable to that promise I made a year ago. And I want to tell you that what I'm going to share is raw because I'm raw. Um, I'm not apologizing for the rawness. I just want to be clear. Um, I want to be clear about what's going to unfold. As Hannah Gadsby likes to say, it's about managing expectations. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take a deep breath, and I encourage everybody else to join me in taking a big breath. My mother is in hospice dying and I'm the daily witness her death project manager you know it's one thing to be sitting in a theater and watching the world turn upside down while laughing myself into unconsciousness which I did recently when I went to go see Mike Birbiglia it it might feel like a death but it's only in truth a blip like coca-cola what my mom is going through is the real thing. And I've got more than a front row seat. I'm right on stage, witnessing the dying of the person responsible for bringing me into this world. On June 11th, my mom called me. She was in serious pain 10 days after about in the hospital for what they diagnosed as colitis. Again, despite her doctor begging her and me begging her to call 911 before she called me to save precious time that could in fact save her life, my mom always calls me first. On that night, as I raced the ambulance to the ER, it hit me. <laughs> she calls me first because I am her 911. Test results showed a bowel obstruction, a hiatal hernia that had punched her stomach into her heart cavity, and she was battling an infection in her left lung and right psoas. The ER doctor, the same one who had seen her 10 days before, whispered to me, none of this was present last week, well it is now, and said that the gastrointestinal surgeon wanted to airlift her to emergency surgery in Denver. I called one brother in California, the other brother already asleep in Virginia. It was about two o'clock in the morning. We said no thank you to the midnight helicopter ride that wasn't on her bucket list and cast aside the call for heroic surgeries that she probably wouldn't survive. Next on the avoiding death menu, 
a tube inserted down her nose and into her stomach. A nonchalant nurse said, I've done hundreds of these. They are very uncomfortable. <laughs> I told you it was raw. My mom looked confused. How is any of this possible? I've worked so hard to take such good care of myself. Mostly true, but that hernia procedure she put off while taking care of my dad for the last eight years of his life, coming back to punch her stomach into her heart cavity. The scoliosis she didn't know she had until I was diagnosed with it at 13 years old, and that she was too old to have treated, twisting her bowels and diminishing her lung capacity. The other stuff, no clue. I stepped into the ER hallway with the doctor. I begged him to admit her so that we could make some decisions as a family. My mom was soon taken to room three, 314. The next morning, a very a tall, very tall, older, very white male surgeon thought it would be a useful, set, useful lesson for his surgical minions to bully my 93-year-old mom. When she hesitated about the tube, he belittled her. When she said she wasn't sure she wanted it, he coldly informed her, if you don't get the tube, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get gangrene and die. I was on my feet, ready to grab that arrogant asshole and throw him out of the room. Thankfully, I didn't have to because an angel in the form of a palliative nurse called a timeout, whispered to the asshat surgeon and his minions, and they quickly left. She sat down with my mother, and in that moment, everything changed and we began playing what I like to call, let's make a deal with death. Okay, for those of you too young to know about this, I grew up in the high era of TV game shows. From The Price is Right to Password to early and classic Jeopardy, but one stood above them all. Let's make a deal with Monty Hall and the beautiful door opener, Carol Merrill. According to Google Gemini, the premise of let's make a deal is that contestants are offered deals and must choose to keep what they have or trade for a chance to win bigger prizes. The show's defining feature is that the other item is hidden from the contestant until they make their choice. How's that for a fun metaphor for the human condition? Our Carol Merrill, AKA the palliative nurse, talked us through door number one, modern medical torture. Door number one, she tells us, contains all the medical bells and whistles intended to keep you alive as long as medically possible, no matter the quality of life, no matter how many midnight trips to the ER, no matter how many asshat surgeons want to rip you open, sticks tube, stick tubes in you, your, your nose, your ribs. My mom looked at me, I nodded at her, and she said, no thank you. Behind door number two, comfort, AKA, Hospice, bingo. After we chose door number two, everything changed. My mom was no longer viewed as a condition or something to fix. She was seen as a human who needed comfort. They put a sticker outside of her hospital door, one with a hummingbird mid-flight, reaching into our state flower, the Columbine. If I ever get a tattoo, that's gonna be the one. The palliative nurse delivered a comfort quilt that we spread over my mom's bed in the hospice center where she spent a few days before she went home to die. Well, in case you need to hear this, <laughs> no surprises, door number two is no picnic. It translates into morphine four times to six times a day. Ativan for anxiety, a heating pad always on, and lots of sweets. The strange thing is my mom never had a sweet tooth. She'd enjoy a square or two of dark chocolate or maybe some ice cream or a Mandelbrot, the Jewish version of a biscotti, but with much more oomph. Now I watch her pick at dinner like she's a toddler and then dive full face into whatever sweet is on her plate. <laughs> Cookies, brownies, cobblers. She's discovered Boston cream pie. <laughs> well, you know, and as amusing as that is, the sugar craving is part of the process. See, the brain is working extra hard to function um, and process, and glucose is what makes this happen. For my mom, whose amazing brain is ebbing away like a low tide that's never going to return, she's become a sugar hound. She always asks me if I want some, and when I say no because of gluten and dairy restrictions, I can tell she's relieved. <laughs> Gotta keep feeding that brain. <laughs> so the initial diagnosis, a few days to a few weeks. 
But being the starker Yiddish for jaws, she is, we're on month number three. That includes two inpatient hospice visits, 24-7 home aid care to the tune of $7,000 a week, and that is without any medical attention whatsoever, and her long-term care policy that she's been diligently paying into for 22 years, barely covering half of that. Then one day, after she had her caretaker call me at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning to relate that she was in a deep amount of pain after a paramedic challenged me on why my spry mother is being admitted to hospice, we made the hard decision to have mom move to a skilled nursing facility. I cried as I packed up what remains of a lifetime, discarded and donated things I don't want in our garage or home. I've re recreated her sweet apartment as much as I've been able to. She has a private room, as many suites as her 85 pound frame can handle, and people making sure she stays safe. Her hearing is deteriorating daily, and I worry that she won't one day be able to hear me say, I love you. Someone recently asked me a question I couldn't really answer and really pissed me off. <laughs> they asked me when I was going to be back. <laughs> My only answer to that, nothing that I want to say out loud. Because not only is the answer too excruciatingly painful, but because the truth is, the person they are referring to as coming back is not coming back. That's what grief does. It changes us if we let it. So I'm wearing a pin that came in a sweet death doula package one of my daughters and her partner sent to me. It reads, Grief in process. It says something that is apparent and also hidden. My mom is still here, still taking up her rightful space in this realm, and yet I'm grieving because door number three is ajar, and as much as I try, I can't keep it closed forever. As a storyteller, there are stories I cannot wait to share. This is not one of them. And while it's not over, I'm acutely aware of the ending. I'm grateful to be able to tell this story as my mother's daughter, as a writer, and part of our human community. So I want to say something to my mom. <laughs> mom, I'm in it for the whole shebang. The ugly, the painful, the gross, the embarrassing, the excruciating ending. Because you are here until you're not. And that's what we're supposed to do. While you can still hear me, I want to say these two things. I love you. We're not done. Thank you. powerful. Thank you so much. I feel like we need to, you started reminding us to breathe. Can we take some more breaths? I, thank you. Steph Luhan is a local singer-songwriter. They write about life, healing, and love. Please welcome Steph Luhan to our stage. you guys came from that way. <laughs> so I was called misbehaving. <clears throat> Just do you, and I'll do me. My 
my way yeah time for Steph Lujan. In 2006, Jennifer Weiss was suddenly and spontaneously inspired to write Inventory of Love. In doing so, she became a poet, though she didn't realize it at the time, since that first poem, so far close to 100, have emerged. Jennifer has been called a woman of honesty and integrity who won't rest until she finds deep truth for herself and for others. The material of life is the material of her poetry. Please welcome Jennifer Weiss to our stage. Wow. I mean, it is really an honor to share the stage with these people. Um, 
all those who have already graced us, and I'm sure what's still to come. Um, it's not that often that I feel like I bring my work to a place where authentic hearts are welcome. So this is pretty nice. Uh, so I was just going to say that sometimes life is hard, and I've found it helpful sometimes over the last 18 years now um, to use a poem to express my experience kind of from the inside out. Um, and maybe uh, I've got three poems for you tonight, and maybe you'll be able to relate to some of them, some of it, um, or maybe you'll learn something new in the process from listening. Uh, it feels really good to be witnessed. And sometimes when I tell my story, it turns out I also speak for others. So the first poem that I chose for tonight is called Trampoline Jump to the Moon. I wrote it in 2008, uh, and it's about infertility. It's not like I haven't already waited approximately 13 years, all that time wanting to be a mother, sometimes the feeling more underground, sometimes less. We've been trying since this time last year, sponsoring ever hopeful socials in my womb, where it would be so nice if the sperm would just gather the courage to swim up to an egg and ask it just this once to dance. <laughs> After 13 years, one more night shouldn't seem so long. We are so far one day past when I expected my period to come. My hopes have soared again like a trampoline jump to the moon with one cautious, careful whisper, reminding me that allowing myself to hope also means inviting the opportunity for a plunge. It shouldn't matter, and I should take each day as it comes. Only this one day has come to taunt me. I'm tired now of the monthly dance. I dance alone in my own mind, where I stand at a crossroads wondering, will I be allowed to go to the left or will I be sent to the right? There's no reason to believe we couldn't have a child and no reason to expect that we can. I'm trying to trust Moses will come down the mountain. I'm trying to refrain from the golden calves we build when we can no longer bear to wait. It might be better to prepare myself for that spot of blood in my pants. Imagine myself welcoming it like an old friend pretending that I am oh so glad it's here. I never doubted for a minute it would arrive. With probably a hundred plausible reasons to be one day late, the trampoline still manages to bounce me up and up and up and up. Epilogue. And then one tiny drop of blood comes to say, Moses is not here yet. And without embarrassing him, I, I will say that my 14-year-old son is in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> um, this poem <clears throat> is a poem I wrote at a time when someone dear to me in our community experienced a death. And I wrote this in 2021, and it's called, There Should Be a Poem for This. There should be a poem for this when Katrina's dad dies at 64, one month after the sweet, joyous birth of his younger daughter's first new baby girl, when he was stabilizing, it seemed, and medicine was doing all that it knows how. There should be a poem <clears throat> and time together to hug Katrina, who, of course, is still in shock. Hold her and cry. She could cry for her dad, and I could cry for my brother, and also still for my mom. For the way they each fought to live, for the loving efforts we valiantly exerted to help and love and take care as needed. If we were together in one place, we would stop everything. 
we are doing everything that needs to be done. We would bring the kids home from school in the middle of the day and let them play or cry, be confused or angry. I would write a poem. Instead of calling the lawyer on my to-do list, instead of sitting down finally to focus my brain this very morning after seven weeks on the financial and legal and logistical details that have needed my full attention since the day my brother died. I would call my friends all over the country and the world. They would stop too and pause, remembering friends Tom and Kara, sister Shona, the imperfect dad, the sweet beloved mother, the stepdad and grandparents, the sister-in-law who left four young children behind. We would honor the anniversary of Jill's death, which I suddenly realized was yesterday. The world would stop for a moment. We could feel this in our hearts, honor the ones we love, be together, sustain each other physically, emotionally, spiritually. There should be a poem for this. Not a text, not a Facebook post, not three days of bereavement leave before returning to work. There should be a hug, a collapse, a being held by others. There should be a remembering of who just left us all alone here on this side of the veil. <clears throat> we should be together with the ones who are still left. The tears and the wailing could flow gently and with a roar, not only in the shower or in the car. There should be a poem and we would hold each other in it. And hopefully there's an arc to this, so you might feel, maybe you'll feel some relief from the third one, I don't know. Um, this is a poem I wrote one time when I was in the thick of my own healing process uh, and feeling a little weary. And I wrote this one in 2017. It's called, You Have to Be Fierce. Hmm. You have to be fierce to find your way out of pain through the pain. You have to be willing to walk barefoot on coals, feel the flames, feel the heat. You have to say enough is enough. I am the tip of the iceberg. What treasures and horrors lurk beneath? You have to face it again and again. You stop and you rest, catch your breath. Then take another dive when it's time. You laugh, you cry, you are alone, you find friends. You crumble, you are nothing. You can't, you can. You can't, but you can. You keep going. Claw your way out, claw your way through, claw your way deeper down or you will never be done. You will never be done, but don't give up. Keep going, it's all right. Keep going, you will learn. We've got your back. Don't ask what is fair. Just ask, do I wanna feel alive? Do I wanna feel, do I want? You have to be fierce. Find courage, let the heart rage. Let nothing go unnoticed. Feel the pain, heal the pain. Let your, look your own true self in the eye, then push through. You can do it, we know you can. You don't even have to believe, but you do have to be fierce. Jennifer, can we hear it again for Jennifer? This is called Simple Thing. In a little 
time the sting goes down It always does But I will hardly be the same <clears throat> In a final tug of hope And the will come unbound What an awfully simple thing The setting free of all that we ever been to each other no guarantees but we knew how to fall in love yeah but staying there we weren't prepared now we're steeped in all we've borrowed and memories and this fatigue are all we share no title tidal wave it's difficult to behave Notice how the sun goes down without a fuss And I smile for the inspiration As our love, our love is taken, it's taken its last of a thousand breaths And it's lace among old regrets It's difficult to behave in ways that are good for me right now But I'm trying to settle into the peacefulness that begins with Letting these waves move me oh, let this be a lesson learned It's been earned through contemplation And the risk of casual Claim for seen, forsaken. Our efforts are not in vain, just gone to seed. I wish I could rest upon the bosom of the unknown. Yeah, is it possible comforts there? Yeah, I would lay my head down with trust or oh, with tears of weariness. And regardless of my doubts, I'd be taken care of. I'll take care of. Oh my God, there's a sacredness about this, isn't there? And I am caught between a poignant sense of sorrow and belief. And oh my God, cannot live this moment for me, I know. But I've just asked them here to breathe some life into these words I I speak, yeah, like these. In a little time, the sting goes down. It always does, but I will hardly be the same. who will be coming back for one more song, so something else to look forward to. Pedro Silva is a burgeoning comedian and director of the Liberation Comedy Project and host of the What's So Funny About podcast. 
By day, Pedro is the director of engagement for the nonprofit Unify, which works in the area of minimizing toxic polarization and fostering individual and community thriving. Prior to these roles, Pedro served as a pastor and civic leader. Please welcome Pedro Silva to our speech. I also want to say give it up for everybody. This is a, a pretty amazing space to do comedy in, especially when you're not the only <laughs> comedian. Um, and we had all these other emotions. I was like about to cry on some songs. I was like, I'm not feeling very, very uh, comedy-ish right now. But, um, but, but let's get into it. So uh, somebody mentioned earlier where you, uh, anger was mentioned. And I learned really early that anger was my superpower if I knew how to use it right. And I discovered it in an interesting way. I was coming home from school one day and I was trying to avoid bullies because I was always kind of picked on because I was small and kind of a little different, let's say, to people. And so I was walking home feeling a little dejected, but I was trying to lift myself up. And I was like, I don't care what people say about me. I'm just going to hold my head up high. And all of a sudden I heard, and I was like, turn around, it's a dog. And I'm like, well, that's a terrible way to end this day. And the, <laughs> and the dog started coming at me. And I'm like, ah, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. And I'm like, I'm like, oh crap, this dog's gonna get me. I got away from the bullies, but now I'm about to get eaten by a dog. And then all of a sudden, this feeling came over me that I wasn't very familiar with. And I eventually realized it was anger. And as I was running from the dog and I almost got home, but I was scared that if I just turned too much, the dog was going to catch me running to my house. So I tried to outrun the dog. And then this anger kept building up and building up. And I was like, why am I running from this dog? Why are these people wanting to pick with me? Why? And this rage came over me and I was like, I just stopped. And then I turned around and the dog stopped and was like, hmm? <laughs> and I turned around and I looked at the dog and the dog knew what was going down. <laughs> I started chasing that dog. <laughs> so I started running after the dog and I'm running down the street and I'm like, yeah. and people see me, a couple of neighbors are like, what is wrong with that boy? And I'm just running and I'm telling myself, I'm going to catch this dog and I'm going to bite it just like it wanted to bite me. And I was like, and I was just tasting. I didn't care if I was going to eat the dog hair. It didn't matter. I was like, I'm going to get it. And I just ran. I couldn't catch it. So then I was like, yeah, okay. I got a plan now because I was so pissed both with the dog and the world and my own like fear that I was like, I'm never going to let myself feel like this. So whenever I feel afraid, I'm going to let my anger do its job. And so the way I prepared for it is I knew which house the dog had slipped out from. So on my way home from school the next day, I was like, hello. And the dog's like, <laughs> and he's just looking at and just barking at me over the fence. And then I went and clink, opened up the latch. Started, the dog's like, oh yeah, we're going to do this again? And then I'm like, ah, ah, and I'm running back after the dog. And then somebody said, I, I see what you're doing, boy. I'm going to tell your mama, I'm going to tell your mama, you don't sit and let this dog go. So that, I, that ended that way of approaching my fear. But I told myself from now on, for the rest of my life, whenever I feel fear, I'm going to face it and I'm going to let my anger do its work. And so I ended up having these three fears that were the top of my fear list. The first one was public speaking. Can you believe it? <laughs> the second one was Adolf Hitler, which I'll get into in a minute. And the third one was Madonna. <laughs> it doesn't make that much sense. But I was, I was terrified of her a little bit more than Hitler. And so the first one came because my family was very dramatic and performative. My mom, my brothers, my cousins, but I just like reading books and then keep to myself. And my mom kept saying, how can you be my son when you just sit in the corner reading books all the time? And I was just like, I don't know, because that's all I wanted to do. I would just every summer get a pile of books, sit in the corner, first thing in the morning, read, 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 flip them out, read, 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 flip, read, read, go back to the library, stack back up, do it again. So my mom decides that she's going to make me overcome this fear, and she signs me up for a black history presentation. Now my brother is gonna do this with me and my brother, performative, just like my mom. So we go out and I'm like, mom, please don't make me do this. She's like, oh, you're gonna do it and you're not gonna embarrass me either. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So we show up to the event and my brother just is all happy 
the song starts playing, and my brother's like, dun 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 hey, stars don't carry money, they only glow, you know, and he's like super excited, and I'm standing next to him like this. <laughs> not moving, not doing anything. And I'm like thinking in my head like, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. And I look at my mom and I had this look on her face like, don't you feel sorry for me? Don't you know that you shouldn't have put me in this situation? And like a good mom would do, they would encourage you, but my mom didn't do that. She did like this, she pointed at me. And I was like still standing there like in shock. My brother's just singing along. And all of a sudden her finger goes from pointing at me, her thumb goes up and I go, oh, she's proud of me. And then I'm like, well, at least I stood up here, but then I see her thumb moving across and then it comes to her neck. And, like, <laughs> and I was like, oh. So, <laughs> so then I was like, oh crap. And so what I started doing is I started cracking up laughing. And that's all I could do. I was like, <laughs> And everybody's like, what is going on? Is that part of the show? And my brother's still like, stars don't carry money. And I'm like, ha, 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 ha. And then I stop, and then I run, and I run straight down the aisle, run out, and then I start praying, God, save me. Take me away from here. I don't know what to do. It was a whole mess. But eventually, as you can tell, I overcame that fear. That's for another story. So then Adolf Hitler. Why? Because he made no freaking sense to me. I couldn't understand how this crazy person can make so many other people crazy. And the craziest thing that I didn't understand about him was he would say that blonde haired, blue eyed people were the best. And I was like, has this fool looked in a mirror? <laughs> and so it freaked me out that someone could use words in a way that would make people crazy and the people's own eyes would be deceived. And I'd be like, how is this possible? But I thought I'd never have to face that fear. Because, hey, he's gone. Well, <laughs> last is Madonna. How do I get afraid of Madonna? Well, sadly, my mom and dad divorced when I was two years old, and my dad married a white lady. And my mom told me, you better never bring a white woman home ever in your life. I will kill you. And so I was like, note to self, I will not under any circumstances, bring a white woman home. And then one day, in 1989, I turned on MTV and I saw Madonna. And she was singing a song and it was, it's becoming famous again. It's like, life is a mystery. And I'm like, it is a mystery. Everyone must stand alone. I'm like, I am alone. I hear you call my name. And it feels like home. And I'm like, I want a home. And so I'm looking at her with her curly brown hair in the video. Then she comes out and the whole video is about a, a innocent black man who went to jail for a crime he didn't commit. She was a witness to the crime. She runs from the scene and runs into black Jesus. Black Jesus looks at her and goes, mm -hmm. and then she goes, oh, I gotta change her heart. She goes and tells the police that the black man's innocent and they let him free. I'm like, this white woman's amazing. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'll never marry a white woman. I'll never date a white woman except for Madonna. And I will afford, <laughs> avoid Madonna at all costs, which was kind of easy. <laughs> and then life, 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 life. Some years pass, I get on a phone conversation with this woman I've never met before, but contact through her email, I'm talking to her on the phone. And I'm like, I'm single at this time. And I'm talking to her, and I go, are you white? <laughs> and she goes, yes. I said, whew, I'm so glad because I don't date white people. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then she's like, and she's like, well, maybe you'll change your mind when we meet. And I'm like, never. But I met her and she had curly brown hair, just like Madonna. She asked me about the Bible and I married her. So that I had to get over that fear. And the last back to Adolf Hitler. I thought there'd never be anybody that dumb again, and there'd never be any people dumb enough to fall for his crap ever again until Orange Julius Caesar. <laughs> and I will end with this little piece. I have several friends who have absorbed this person's way of being, and I've had to deal with them. Not all of them white, some of them 
black and some of them brown. And I've tried and tried and tried to talk to them, make peace with them, not try to change their minds, but just try to understand where they're coming from. And one friend said something to me that just blew my mind, and I had to face this fear. I said, bro, I hear everything you're saying. I just can't agree with you. And I don't understand how you could cross this line given that you're from this group that gets demeaned by this person. Please help me understand. And then he said something that was on the edge of profound. He said, look, man, I'm not a smart person. And I was like, okay. He's like, some people may even call me dumb. And I was like, all right. I'm trying to see what he's trying to, you know, maybe Rocky Balboa me, you know, and just give me like a little Rocky Balboa speech. And he goes, but when I hear this man speak, I feel smart. <laughs> And I said, my friend, that was indeed the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I agree with you that you are not smart. And there's one more person that's going to be calling you dumb, and it is me. And so I faced that fear. And now I'm just waiting for the next one. Thanks. Yeah, give it up for Pedro one more time. Uh, the song is called Catharsis, and I will say a little bit about it. It's going to sound like a diss track at first, but you need to follow the story because it's ultimately about me and my process. But there's lots of swearing. <laughs> Catharsis. Right. What is your problem with me from the beginning? the 
direction I bury. So where does that leave us? I'm banged up and I'm sore. And there never really was an us. And this is mine and not yours. I'm free now to go and brush the dirt from my clothes. Walking lighter, more at ease. And that's what comes from letting go. All this was meditation, a balm for my soul. And if you'll pardon the presentation, I do prefer a more peaceful role. But despite how it seems, it felt so good to scream. If you're radically kind of an asshole. Yeah, just for a day. First up, please welcome the wonderful Audrey. Yeah. Dream big. Dream big. Dream big. Dream big. In the smallest letters, in the biggest room, dream big. Shh, don't say it too loud, or they might dream. Dream big. Dream big. Dream big. Dream big. The words of the gatekeepers firmly in place to make sure if you dream big, dream big, you won't dream too big, too big. And if you do, you do, you do dream big. They are there to point it out that it is too big, way too big to fit through their gate, their small gate, their small gate, a very small gate that is way too small, too small for your Big dreams, big dreams, big dreams. Your very big dreams. And then gently, gently, they'll offer you a generous offer, a big offer, a very big offer. A very nice seat, a nice seat, a nice seat under their feet where you can dream, dream big, dream big. <laughs> Thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs> Please welcome to our stage, Martin. Madison time. The Madison, the Hully Gully, the Monster Mash, the Potato, and the Twist. Dream Lover was playing on the box. Every night I hope and pray a dream lover comes my way, a girl to hold me in my arms and to know the magic of her charms. Pastor Stephen prayed too long. I should have never clued him in that we were Baptists. Then he, Christ, he tried to save my soul. <laughs> Jesus Christ and all his carpenter friends hanging off the cross. I told him not now. <laughs> No, really, I've made a deal with God, and I didn't have the heart to tell him I was God. <laughs> I went to the door, and I called for the undertaker. He asked if I was sure. Do you need more time? No, thanks. I'm complete. I said my goodbyes, cried, prayed, kissed her on her cold forehead. As he went to go get help to load her body onto the gurney, I played an old Leuven Brothers tune, Kentucky. Kentucky, you are the dearest land of outside of heaven to me. Kentucky, your laurels and your red bud trees. When I die, I want to rest upon your graceful mountain so high. Kentucky, that's where God will look for me. They wrapped her in a nasty old blanket I'd brought from home, and I walked with the undertaker down to the waiting vehicle, the white Toyota van. I'd hoped for a long black limousine. Guess they don't do that anymore. 
I tried to remember everyone's name that was there that night. Rico, Morgan, Megan, Logan, Pastor Stephen. I thought about how she made me kiss her goodbye when she would drop me off at school. I thought about how we were always Kentuckians. I remember how she told me of the house on Bell Street, the best house ever. She said every house on that street had kids her age to play with. As she spoke of her childhood, I imagined a Sears and Roebuck mail order craftsman circa 1940 with a 1954 Ford sedan parked in front, all in black and white, of course. She had only told me that story a few weeks ago. Much of her story I didn't know. I didn't get a lot of when I was your age talks growing up, at least any I can remember. She told me the girls didn't clean the scuff marks off their saddle shoes back in the day. When my brother and I found a scrapbook in the back of the closet, we learned Elvis was king. At 2.30 every day, the Anderson Grill would remove the ashtrays from the tables so the high school could, kids couldn't fill them with ketchup. It made her mad when she had to have a co-signer on a home loan because she was only 19, while in a conversation at the soda counter at the Rexall drugstore with a friend that worked at the draft board, she discovered my dad wouldn't have to go if she was pregnant with me. After we moved to Lexington, she got into real estate and integrated neighborhoods. She said the Lord was looking out for her as she was the only one in the office that didn't get death threats. She liked Al Green and Ray Charles and would play their records loud enough to be heard over the vacuum cleaner on a Saturday morning. She pretended not to like country music but knew the words to every Hank Williams song. <laughs> she had a fondness for the Everly Brothers, that tune, Wake Up Little Susie, a song about falling asleep at the drive-in and not getting home till 4 a.m. I'm not so sure they were sleeping. <laughs> she always had a Christmas gift for the milkman. I asked if he was my dad. She said, no, the Fuller Brush Man. I didn't get the joke and returned to reading my uh, back of the box of the cereal. Kentucky, I miss the voices singing in the silvery moonlight. Kentucky, I miss the hound dog Jason Coon. I know my mother, dad, and sweetheart are waiting for me. Kentucky, I will be coming soon. I'll come up here tomorrow, collect her things. I'll throw it all away. There's a blanket or a shawl. I'll take that and put it somewhere where I can see it to be my secret. I'll loan it to people when they come over to keep them warm but won't tell them who it belonged to. Thank you, Martin. Thank you everyone for being here. Happy birthday, open stage. We can't wait to keep celebrating you. Give it up one more time for Stephanie Hahn. For the funny and thought-provoking Pedro Silva. For the, for the poetic Jennifer Weiss. And the deeply moving Lisa Trank. And for all of you, um, we would not all be here tonight in this beautiful room with this lighting and this stage if it weren't for Audrey Grace. Please give it up for Audrey Grace. Yeah. There's so much that goes into organizing events like this, so much, and it's wonderful to sit in your seats and be entertained, and I hope that you were, that you are. Um, so it's so important to support events like this. If you can, um, give what you can to make sure that more events like this happen, more creative programming where we're hearing poetry and music and comedy, and we leave here feeling, well, full. There's a lot more people to thank. I wanna thank Tumbleweed Art Collective, Longmont yeah. Public Media. <laughs> a special thank you to Mountain Fountain for donating those delicious gluten-free pies. <laughs> 
thank you to Phil for, uh, for archiving this, for recording this, and making sure that we remember what this event was. Thank you.